Hello, hello, hello. It is me, it is me, your True Hill Phenom SP3. This is a special video for you as we review Stone Cold Steve Austin A&E Biography. You loved our reviews of Dark Side of the Ring, so we decided that we were going to review some of these A&E biographies on WWE superstars, starting off here with Stone Cold Steve Austin. I am joined, of course, by the conducer of reporting, Mr. Romeo Anthony Colon. What's up? I came dressed for the occasion. I got my beer. I thought about I thought about the goatee and shaving my head, but I was like, that would have been a bit too much. So I just stopped at that. Could have gone all the way. You That's really could have. Yeah, I know she did. Well, before we get into things, give this video a thumbs up. Share this video with all your wrestling fans, friends, family. Of course, if you are new to the True Hill Heat YouTube channel, you push that subscribe button right now. And, of course, push the bell. Press all so you always get notified for when we have new content right here on True Hill Heat. Romeo, you do a great job of guiding us on the DeLorean on True Rewind or being the point man on Wednesday Night Warriors or NX3. So take it away here. I love the way they started this, uh, asking Steve what the difference between Stone Cold the Performer and Steve Austin the Man is. This is a clip from long ago, when Steve was in his prime. And Steve starts to cut a promo and stops because even he doesn't know what the difference is. That was a beautiful way to start this. It was. It was. Very unique way. And they go into the early beginnings of Steve in Edna, Texas. He's got a ton of siblings. They interview two of his brothers and a sister. I don't think I've seen them interviewed before, so I thought it was already interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, I I enjoyed that part of it because we never really see the family of Stone Cold Steve Austin, which we would probably we would get to later on in the in the in this documentary. And then he goes to Chris Adams training camp. Steve says nobody there looked like a wrestler. Mick Foley was working there; he was injured. He said he saw him but didn't meet him. And that he was the only good one there. That's crazy. The Steve Austin's training to be a wrestler and Big Foley's there watching. What are the odds? Small world, because at that time we had, you know, the appearance of the of the Undertaker during this documentary, but he was coming up in the Texas area as well at kind of like the same time, pretty much. Dutch Mantel tells him to change his name because he doesn't want him being confused with Dr. Jeff, Steve Williams. He gives him 15 minutes to change it can't think of a name dutch says you're steve austin wow grandpa dutch shout out to my grandpa dutch mantel or my co-host on smack talk either or you could call him my grandpa you could call him my co-host on smack talk but that man is a genius when it comes to creative decisions you know his legacy in professional wrestling is vast but i think this is kind of one that you put at the top of your resume that you gave steve austin that name missy hyatt interviews stunning steve austin who on the way to the ring learns he's from hollywood california with his thick texas accents he's got a booger coming down his nose it's not the best debut Oh, yes, yes. Humble, humble beginnings for for Steve Austin, no matter where you you want to start this timeline of where he would eventually go. They briefly mentioned the Hollywood Blondes with him and Brian Pillman. And he says he's a secondary performer in WCW. They they didn't think I was marketable. He injures his tricep and Bischoff fires him. And my question to you, could Steve have ever been Steve in WCW if he does not get hurt and he stays there? Does does the result of the Monday Night War change any bit whatsoever if Steve isn't in WWF? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that he kind of put the the whole picture together with like where WWF was at and how Stone Cold, you know, Austin came into the company and you know had this beginning that wasn't what he kind of in pictured and then he had to develop his character and the rise of Austin is kind of, you know, 
parallel with the rise of WWF, I don't see that happening in WCW because the way they got their rise was focusing on guys from WWF where Hogan, Hall, Nash, the NWO, you know, they develop they develop a, a new version of the Sting character and eventually Goldberg and, you know, Diamond Dallas Page kind of on that like that tier below him, but they never really focused on guys that kind of came from the bottom there. And you think WWF could have got as big without Steve if Steve was in WCW? No. That WW, WWF does not win the war without Stone Cold Steve Austin. I, I that's that, And that's a strange thing to say because I'm, I'm saying that WCW doesn't win the war by keeping Stone Cold. <laughs> but WWF doesn't win the war without getting Stone Cold. So it's like... It's it's an interesting situation because I feel like one needed the other. WWF needed Austin just like Austin needed WWF. And then the ringmaster is born. Vince with the phone call, you want to be the ringmaster? You master the ring. Uh, Steve says this sounds like shit, but <laughs> said he wasn't going to act like a big shot and just work within the system. Steve is watching the Iceman tapes, the documentary on Richard Kuklinski. And he says, like, that helped him think of the idea of being menacing. And WWE gives him a list of names. Fang McFrost, Otto Van Ruthless, Chili McFreeze. What was the worst name on this list? What was the one? I think it was the one that Taker says, but Frosty McFreeze is pretty shitty. That's, uh, that's pretty, that's pretty, that's pretty shitty. His wife says, drink your tea before it gets stone cold. Bam. He wanted Victoria, Texas. Bam. He liked the color black from Darth Vader and the Oakland Raiders. Bam. And the shaved head, the goatee, everyone's just more menacing with a goatee. It's true. <laughs> I, I was pulling it off for a while, and then everything started growing in. But it's, I can get back there. It looks, it look, it makes you look tougher, especially with the bald head. He was right because he he didn't have the long blonde locks anymore. He only had the stubble. No one's rocking a buzz cut. No one's gotten over with the buzz cut. You ball, you make a bald head, and then boom. Straight to the top. Something Hulk Hogan refused to do. <laughs> and then it's time for King of the Ring 96, the curtain call. Remember that? Triple H knew he was going to win, but had to be punished. Bruce Pritchard talked the pecking order. Steve was the next guy who needed that boost. Uh, Michael Hayes tells him about the promo Jake the Snake cut. Austin beats Jake and just he thinks about John 316 and he cuts the Austin 316 promo. And it was like right there. Everybody just knew. Everybody knew. I wondered, did they really know at the time? Did they really know what they what he was gonna become? I don't I don't think they knew what he was going to do and their their booking of him after he won the King of the Ring kinda showed that they didn't know what they were gonna <laughs> they had with him. Like they I, I this is one thing that I don't like is that they, you know, yes, the the epitus and the catalyst for Austin where you saw the character kind of envision was yes the austin 316 promo but that wasn't the rocket ship that take him straight to the top at SummerSlam, the next big event after king of the ring this dude was on the free for all against yokozuna he wasn't even on the damn main show it wasn't until the fall when brett the hitman heart which is the big omission in this whole documentary. It wasn't until the fall when Bret the Hitman Hart returned and chose Stone Cold to be the guy that he feuded with during his return that Austin really got the momentum that he needed to get there. Like, they flashed through the WrestleMania 13 match, but that is more the catalyst for where Stone Cold was going. And to go back a little bit, and to talk about, you know, what we were left off, you know, true rewind for all of you folks, you know, who who want something else to watch after you're done watching this biography, go back and watch true rewind. But to talk about where we left off with WrestleMania 12, doesn't it look like WWF is some big fucking idiots? Why were they going to give the King of the Ring to Hunter Hearst Hemsley? They just <laughs> dropped him out to the fucking Ultimate Warrior. This dude for the last six months been feuding with Henry Godwin. Where these two guys is at, it's like obvious who's the guy to give this push to. Like, why are we going to push the guy who just jobbed out to, to Ultimate Warrior, who got up from his fucking finisher, who's been feuding and dotting hog pens 
for this past six months. Like, what? I'm, obviously, you should push Stone Cold. I see what you did there. What? <laughs> <laughs> then the injury. Owen Hart versus Austin, 1997. Uh, Owen says, you know, he tells Steve, this is how I do the power driver. I, I, I land on my ass, not on my knees. And Steve Austin gets spiked on his head. Steve said he remained calm, although he thinks he's never going to walk again. And Steve calls it the worst roll up in the history of the business. Steve said his hands didn't work. He had to use his elbows to crawl. He's helped by the refs after. He says he's 1% tough, 99% lucky. Steve reveals he cried a bit backstage. He was so scared. They had great backstage footage of this event. And he says nowadays, if he gets cold, his leg that he was dragging doesn't respond the same. He says his neck feels good, though. Very, very scary. It's still uncomfortable to even watch the footage years later. I can't imagine being in the position that uh, Steve was in. He is very, very lucky. The refs picking him up and moving him around, probably not the smartest idea in hindsight. <laughs> yeah. Like, the fact he didn't get stretchered out is just like, what? And he didn't, he say he emphasized that he didn't break his neck, that he bruised his spinal cord, and, like, that was supposed to make it sound better? Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but either either or does not sound like a a more suitable option. So uh, I, you know, God bless him for continuing to wrestle after that. Uh, yeah, I still cringe is very hard to watch. And, you know, even though, you know, you love Owen Hart, you respect his uh, passing, you know, you honor his his life. But you, you get upset in the moment. Of watching it, it's just like, come on, why, why can't you just do knee first? Why, why do you have to land on your ass? Like, there's so many things that can go wrong with this maneuver, and go landing on your ass does not make it any better. So, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard, it's hard to watch, it's hard to look back on, but you know, God bless Stone Cold for walking out of there after that. Looking back, it's amazing how much Austin's, uh, uh, history is intertwined with those two Hart brothers. Wow. Yeah, that, that that's what made the omission of Bret Hart even more atrocious. Like, it's like, you don't even tell us wh- how we even got to the SummerSlam match. Like, you need to tell us the story of Bret and Austin. Like, even if it's just short. It's just Bret. You couldn't get Bret for this documentary. Okay. You just have Austin say, Bret chose me. Uh, he saw I was hot after the Austin 316 promo. See, I'm helping y'all put it all together since y'all telling the story. He was the one that chose me after the Austin 316 promo to be his program on his return back. We took it all the way to WrestleMania. WrestleMania, I had this moment that really made my career. And I was off and running until SummerSlam 1997. Boom! And literally, it took me one or two minutes to, to tell the Bret Hart Sh- Austin story. Like, at least acknowledge it. So so we have a little bit of bridge. You literally floss through, like, eight months. Eight months to a year of his career from... No, a full year you, you fucking glossed over from, from June 1996 to August 1997. Then they talk all, they focus on Mr. McMahon. JR says every star needs a real viable villain. This is, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to keep going on this. But it's like, it's like they told a story where Brett the Hitman Hart doesn't fucking exist. Like, how do you tell the story of Mr. McMahon becoming a character without mentioning the Montreal fucking screw job? Like, it's like, okay. Hopefully, uh, I don't know what's the list. No, there, of... there is a, there is one on Bret Hart. Okay, there's one on Bret Hart. So we have to act like he doesn't exist in Stone Cold Story. <laughs> that's what the, that's basically what you're telling me. They talk about all the crazy things they did in there. A few, the Zamboni, the beer truck, the hospital, the bedpan. Steve talks about the science of trying to find the right sound with the bedpan. Uh, <laughs> what was your favorite part of the Austin McMahon rivalry? The, the weeks after... 
WrestleMania 14, where they do like they put the first Austin versus McMahon match, and he tells Austin to have like his hand tied behind his back. And you know, this is the introduction of Dude Love starts off that first feud of Austin for like those first two months and culminating at Over the Edge 1998. Like that two months of just Monday Night Raw and then you know, Unforgiven over the edge which is great i would probably say yeah like probably if i would just say one moment it would probably be um yeah when austin when he had austin uh come out in the suit and be his corporate champion <laughs> and he eventually rips it off and hits him in the nuts to end the segment uh for me it'll probably it could probably change uh during our true rewind journey watching it all back over again but for me off the top of my head probably the beer bash uh vince swimming through the fucking beer <laughs> and then also also the hospital one uh i'll take it from yeah. here nurse they talk about his impact and popularity being a global star Heyman says he's still among the best merch sellers to this day his brother said everyone had t-shirts that's when it really hit him that his brother was a big star bigger than wrestling cross into the mainstream steve said you he forgot pre- to mention his brother getting emotional about talking yes. about the neck injury Cause that was yes. one of the, that was like a powerful moment. I was like, damn, like you would have thought Steve passed away or got shot or something. Like he was no, really. I can imagine really, seeing that, yeah. seeing your brother go yeah. through that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's not that. Uh, probably has some bad thoughts going through his head. Yeah. Kevin Owens out of nowhere. He said, uh, "I found it interesting." He says, "People can try to be him, but they never will." And this is the guy that has, has uh, adopted the Stone Cold Stunner now. He's got a shirt that says "Stun the World," and I found it very fascinating that he said that. Not in a I, bad way. Not in a bad way. I'm just saying. I feel like uh, Owens kind of embraces and honors Austin, and I I enjoy his whole thought process towards it, saying, you know, Austin, no one's gonna ever be as big as Stone Cold, and it makes it harder for us as you know WWE superstars today. He's kind of g- feeding into that by using the stunner but at the same time he's honoring him by you know the way he asked him for it and everything owens one of the few like main roster superstars that exist right now that they had on us am i missing yeah. anybody uh well not that i remember yeah he was the only main roster and then uh adam cole was on this as well they talk about the sacrifices uh made being on the road triple h talks about austin's pressures at home with family Austin has two daughters. He Austin talks about the birth of one. He had to fly to the next town. He held her, fed her a bottle, and that was it. Steve talks briefly about getting the divorce and how he found comfort and solace living in a double wide. Said he was selfish. His priority was him for the business. And Paul Heyman narrates, he said, it's a price that not many are willing to pay. And, you know, I thought about this. Uh, we forget about that in the pandemic era. Uh, with no house shows, no touring, but eventually things are going to get back to normal, hopefully. And that's what these wrestlers are going to be doing, uh, yeah. giving their personal lives away. Yeah, I mean, that's why you you would kind of think that for a lot of these wrestlers, this has kind of been the best time of their career because they get to be at home for five six days out of the week and just have to work there one day or two days during the week for a pay-per-view it's like it's very great what's going on for them as far as like where they can build their family and get that connection and that time with them you know someone who's on top like a roman reigns you know he he skipped out on a on a wrestlemania payday to go you know protect his family to not be out here during the pandemic when wwe wasn't doing you know the right thing by their performers or didn't have the right precautions and protocol and you know he got to spend basically four months five months with his family and now even now returning he works his one day and then he's at home six to five days out of the week it's pretty great for him like this is probably i I think someone like the rock is probably looking at him like shit i'm jealous of you (laughs) smooth transition because they talk about making new stars to face stone cold and this was this was awesome how they did it. All of a sudden, you just say, "If you smile," oh, so well done. And they got the Rock. Uh, they interview the Rock. The Rock says he studied Steve. He wanted to be in Steve's position. Steve always said, "There's something there. There's something there." Rock talks about it was almost like a big brother kind of bond. 
Yeah. JR says they were competitive and pushed each other. Mark Henry says it never happens. Two comets just crashing into each other. Vince McMahon says it was so much fun to watch. It was a great ride. Austin said it's a friendship that is forever. The Rock says the decision for Steve to take him under his wing changed his life. I love this. I love this. Like, you know what? Like, the Attitude Era was really like high school in a lot of ways. You know, high school or like the the, the, the movie or the Hollywood version of high school. You always had the anti-hero, the loner that everyone loved and everyone gravitated to who fought against the authority. And then you always had, you know, the very popular jock, the one that was funny and, you know, dressed all nice. And then, you know, those two guys were the most popular people. And then you had the guy who got straight A's, you know, was friends with all the teachers. He was close to the principal, who never was as popular as the other two guys. And you can understand his resentment. And that guy, my friends, is Hunter Hearst Hemsley, <laughs> Triple H. Like, Triple H, like, from, from where, they st- where they talked about Austin winning the King of the Ring was because this guy wanted to hug his friends in front of the fans. Like, you can tell that was the impetus. That was the catalyst for Hunter's political game and the way he treated the rock and others around him and protecting his spot and keeping others down you know it all started there because he austin had his moment and he was like man that could have been me so when the rock was on the rise triple h is like no i'm not gonna let him pass me too (laughs) it's like he's like he's like vince Vince, I want to work with Austin. Why are you picking him over me? And to hear like Rock and Austin talk about it, it was like they had the relationship and the closeness that Rock <coughs> never had with Triple H and that Austin never had with Triple H. And that's the reason why really on top, Austin and Triple H never really had that time on top. Like they had a couple of big matches like No Mercy 99. You know, we were supposed to get the triple threat where Rock, Austin and Triple H at, at Survivor Series 99 before Austin went out with his neck injury for a year. And then eventually he came back and he got to feud with, you know, Triple H being the person behind the who ran down Austin. But it was just like you never heard about them having that type of relationship. And I think Austin, we got to hear from both guys. And it was like what Rock said, like Austin chose him because he saw that he saw his rise. And he was like, no, this is the guy like it's not it's not the straight A student. It's not the principal's favorite. It's the popular jock. It's so fascinating when you break it down like that, because one you could see how it would drive Triple H crazy. Uh, and two, that curtain call just has so much more meaning and history of, of what it caused. But um, it's Triple so H. it's so pivotal in Triple H's career. It's so pivotal in, and in, of that, in Austin, Austin Austin's career because of that. Yeah, yeah. like and it because is, of that, the Rocks. <laughs> yeah, and because yeah, and because of that, the Rock. Yeah, and Rock what pretty much debuts like a couple of months like six months after that whole curtain call i would say things still turned out well for triple h in the end oh well of course well, of course <laughs> then they talk about uh stone cold's personality being lonely at the top he's a lone wolf he the dta was real life don't trust anybody or it should have been don't trust triple h dta h h <laughs> <laughs> He talks about there was so much jealousy of him. He didn't name names, but you can already, you can already presume. <laughs> but well, whenever he talked about it, like they showed a clip of him and all Hunter working together. <laughs> Foley says it's that's not a good way to go through life. Triple H says, uh, yeah, Steve appeared angry, bitter, paranoid, private. Was that Steve or was that you, Hunter? <laughs> That was him eventually. After after Austin and Rock left, he was like the only way. He's like, I'm I'm the only thing left. <laughs> no, I'm now I'm paranoid. Now I now I understand Austin. Now I I'm scared. I I gotta protect 
my spot, even though we're not doing good in, in the ratings, we're not doing good in the money. I got to hold down this spot. I got to be the number one. I already know your answer, but do you blame Steve for being like this? I, I think everyone's got their own style. Um, he still managed to have friendships, you know, after the business. Like, if when you're as big as how he got, like, it's, it, yeah, you can't, you can't imagine. Like, I understand him a little bit more than Hogan, because I, I feel like, I feel like there's a little bit, like, you, like they said, there's a lot of reality in the Stone Cold Steve Austin character where a lot of it came from him. Like he got his name from his from his wife. He randomly got the name changed from Dutch Mantel. And he had to basically grow into this character that was kind of created in that first promo in ECW and then develop over time through, you know, all these views, Brad Hart, Vince Man, to the point that he became this like huge star. So yeah, I mean, I understand where he's at, but Hulk Hogan. Do you feel like Hulk- Steve is more upfront about who he is? Yeah, Hulk Hogan is more of an actor. Yeah, Hogan. Hogan tries to tries to come across like he's the he's the greatest guy. He's the nice guy, and it's kind of it's kind of like he feels like the machine. He feels like more the machine than Austin. Austin feels like Rage Against the Machine, like the character, how he got to the point that he got to. It felt more earned than Hulk Hogan overall. Then Steve talks about his daughters, two daughters, a strained relationship from his first wife. He admits he's never won father of the year. He wasn't there. Uh, The daughters stayed in England after 9-11. He cried when he called and saw that one of his daughters had a London accent. Uh, He said they're now older. He's trying to build better relationships with them. And he says they still don't know each other as well as they should. I thought this part hit deep, very, uh, very hard. Um, most emotional part of the episode. Really yeah. sad, really sad. You have a daughter. You could talk on this. Yeah, I mean, that was the saddest part that, you know, he created so many memories for us as fans that he lost out on memories with his kids and the fact that we have to see basically uh still footage of his kids from 2003 when he was uh, retiring from WWE because he doesn't have that re- that type of relationship with them to ask them to talk on camera it's like sad it's sad to really think about that he has a lot he's had a, to do a lot of like rebuilding of his connection and his relationships with people post his uh career so you know it's great that we have so many memories you know of his career and it's made a mark on all of us as fans but we really have to kind of appreciate but also at the same time you know be sad uh, the fact that he lost out on so much with his family then they talk about his walkout steve's frustration with creative once the rock went to hollywood complaining about opponents that weren't ready or groomed for him steve did not want to let go of being the guy you talk about the Brock Lesnar pitched idea to lose to him, no build up. He says, I'll let anyone beat me as long as it's for a reason and there's money behind it. And he says they they described it as he took his ball and went home. How can we forget that? Vince McMahon was very confused. He called three times, left voicemails. Steve went six months hunting, fishing, and drinking, not in that particular order. He got a card from JR. They spoke for hours. JR said he sounded like he really needed to talk. Eventually, he gets Vince and Austin to hash it out. Austin apologized to the locker room, says it was warranted. Was Steve right uh, with what he did? Could he have handled it differently? Do you agree that they had nobody ready for him? I don't understand why you don't put the title on Austin because this is a time where the WWF title was getting passed around a lot post WrestleMania 18. Triple H won it. He lost it to Hogan at Backlash who lost it to Undertaker at Judgment Day and eventually I think two months later in July it went to The Rock before eventually it got to Austin but I mean eventually it got to Brock at, at SummerSlam 2002 but Rock wouldn't have even been here if it wasn't for Austin leaving. So it's like you could have you could have pulled an audible like 
Jim Ross. I I always I always felt like this. I felt like Jim Ross could have done more. God bless you to uh, communicate to Vince. You know Austin the best, and you're in that inner circle. Why don't you communicate of when Vince pitches? Oh, we're gonna have Brock beat Austin on a Monday Night Raw. You know Austin's not gonna be happy with this. So why don't you say? No, I don't, I don't think I want to go to to save with this uh, uh, Vince. I don't think he's gonna he's gonna like this. Why would you pitch it to Austin? Of course, you don't expect him to react like that. But yours, but you know Austin, you know Steve, and you protect the talent. You always say that. You said it here in the documentary. I've always felt like Jim could have done more before it even got to Austin. Then Steve talks about his body was giving signals that it's time to go. He's getting uh, the nerves in his legs and his hands, giving him signs, the atrophy of his muscles. And he decided he wanted to go out to The Rock. But he didn't want to distract The Rock's win from his retirement, so he kept it secret. Only Vince, JR, and The Rock knew. And then he spoke about drinking three bottles of wine a night. Not very recommended, boys and girls. Don't do that. Steve in Seattle, the time of mania, thinks he's dying. They take him to the ER. He was dehydrated. Too much. Because he was taking he was taking cups of coffee yeah. and energy drinks at the same time. Like like okay, folks. If you if you had a little problem, maybe three bottles of wine is okay. Maybe. But don't mix it with caffeine in the morning and energy drinks during the day. Your fucking heart is going to explode. God damn it, Steve. The doctor wouldn't clear him to wrestle, but Steve said, fuck you. This is WrestleMania. (laughs) I'm going to do this. And um, how much longer do you think Steve could have went if his body didn't start to show signs of tearing down? Or maybe if he doesn't even get that injury in Owen Hart. Man, like uh, that's that's all I thought about when they when I had to relive that power driver at SummerSlam 1997. If Owen doesn't land on his ass, it's like how many more years of Austin we would have got? Like, could could Vince and Austin get back on the same page to give Austin like at least maybe one or two more years? Like we saw we saw Steve be J- GM or be a part of the show for another year after. WrestleMania 19, like we could have got to at least WrestleMania 20 and maybe got Steve versus Goldberg, uh, Austin versus Goldberg there, or at that point Austin versus Brock. You 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 left you left with you left not one in the first one. Now you're gonna verse him and a big money situation at WrestleMania 20 inside of Madison Square Garden. So there's a bunch of different options for him at that point. And if he can go longer to to WrestleMania 21, we could possibly maybe we can get Hogan. Maybe we could finally get the Hogan match at WrestleMania 21. Oh, there's... That would have been a lot of politics. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. You know it. Like, oh, hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Then we talk Mania 19. He didn't talk to anyone backstage at Mania because he felt like he would start crying. And he gets choked up talking about it. Yeah. He snaps himself out of it and says he was okay dying in the ring at Mania to the Rock. One other way would you want to die? He relived when the three count happened. The Rock speaks of words. He spoke to Steve. I can't thank you enough for everything you have done. I love you. Steve says, I love you too. And Steve says, two big ass, tough ass guys. Tell them they love each other in the front of millions of people. And this was a unique moment to see Steve get choked up. You never see that. Never. Never. Yeah. And, but... Uh, Man, like, like the the biggest like thing that I got from this whole documentary is how once in a lifetime, and yes, I'm using that term in in relation to The Rock, but how once in a lifetime it was to have two of the top five biggest stars in professional wrestling history hit their peaks at the same time. 
and have like parallel rises like like yes we you could say you could make an argument hogan and macho were you know had, had were around at the same time and they are considered in like the top five top ten but they didn't have parallel rises though like they didn't have it where you know hogan hit the top and then Savage was right behind him. Even when Savage eventually became the WWF champion, Hogan was right there with him, like as his peer. It was, it was like it, not even. They didn't as have a WrestleMania peer. trilogy. Yeah, and not even as his peer. Hogan was always the star over Macho Man. It felt like continuously, and then eventually he did the same thing with Ultimate Warrior a few years later. Like it don't matter what, Hogan was always the star. Whereas you know. Austin, he had the injury. So Rock was able to rise up a little bit more and whatever was between Rock and Austin in like 1999, Rock was right at the same level as Austin by the time he returned at the end of 2000 because he had that time to rise along with Triple H and put on classic moments and classic matches. So it's just crazy that we had these two huge stars that if you ask anybody who's the most influential wrestlers in history, if they don't say Hogan or Ric Flair immediately, they're going to say Austin or Rock. And like that's like if anybody says that's their Mount Rushmore, I can't argue with you because that's for the biggest of all time. But to have two at the same time have these these three huge matches at WrestleMania be the top baby face over like a four year, five year period is just amazing. And it'll never happen again. And hindsight is always twenty twenty, but looking back, should The Rock and Steve Austin have main evented WrestleMania nineteen? Knowing everything you know now? No. No, um because I mean they could have they could have, yeah. I can't say I can't say no. They could have because WrestleMania 19 legitimately had three matches that could have main evented. It, it could have been the main event that it was Brock and uh, you know Kurt Angle. You're putting over a new star in Brock. That makes sense, and they put on a great matchup. Um, they could have put you know Austin in and Rock for sure because that's Austin's last match. I know Vince knows, no one else knows. So I understand not putting in that position because then it's like people are like, hmm, maybe <laughs> it is. And Austin doesn't want to put attention to that. So um, and then uh, Hogan and Vince could have made a it because that was 20 years in the making, pretty much. And that was the whole culmination of like the WrestleMania, the first half of WrestleMania coming in for fruition in the ring. I think it should have made a I think it should have made it. If, if, it feels like a. Uh, Shawn Michaels taker, except we we didn't know. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I I can't. I won't argue with you. I I think that Rock that Brock and Angle was the appropriate main event, especially for the WWE title. But I can't argue if you thought or Austin and Rock should have been because it was Austin's last match. Uh, they talk about his retirements and that it drove him crazy. He hit bottom pretty hard. He had a come to Jesus moment about three years in to get his act together so he could live a longer life. He took. He wanted to take advantage of the name that he worked so hard to build. He moved to Hollywood. He found out acting wasn't really his uh, niche, and so he loved hosting uh, and reality TV. He wanted to move more towards that TV and podcasting. He wanted to keep in touch with people. And he found out that was a good way to do that. And he says he has a Type A personality. He's in a hurry, even when he has nothing to do. Uh, what do you think of him talking about this? How is Austin's life? after wrestling so far i think i think he he it sounds like he kind of got it together it took it took a while but he eventually put it all together figured it out which is great i mean not everything's gonna work out exactly how you thought it would immediately after you decide to you know call it quits on something that you love for so long and you dedicated your life to so I understand that it took a while to kind of get there, but I, I like the journey that he's been on. His podcast was was great. His stuff on the WWE Broken Skull session, the more recent one with Chris Jericho was fantastic. I, I love his work on all the podcasts and Broken Skull sessions that I've seen on WWE Network. 
uh, his movies. He's always hey, I always get a pop out of any movie that he's in, whether it's Longest Yard or any Adam Sandler movie or <laughs> the the movies with Stallone in them. Like he does great stuff. So I'm I'm happy for Stone Cold that he has found something outside of the wrestling world. But I'm always happy when I hear the glass shatter, though. I think he's doing great. I think his his name still it means something. It's so iconic. And it's going to be still be iconic for years to come. Um, the last video package has uh, JR narrating it, talking about life between the curtains and after them. Steve says in his eyes, he's still Steve. And that's all he can say. And that was the end. Let's review this. <laughs> let's, let's do a scale of zero to ten. Okay. Um, I thought this was fun. It's very tough to put that career in whatever time it was, an hour, 30 minutes with commercials, um, you could easily do a six-part series just like you did on The Undertaker. Sure. And you could get so much more in. They did the best they can. Uh, I love the presentation. They brought a lot of big names to interview, names that are worthy to talk about this career. The, the family stuff was very personal, very sad. I, I thought it was the most interesting part of this documentary. Um, the sacrifices that Steve Austin made has to be respected. He he practically lost his daughters almost, but um, I'm glad he opened up about that. That's not easy to talk about. <laughs> yeah, you could easily say I don't want to talk about that, and then still put the documentary. But he did talk about it. He was honest about it, and all the rock stuff that was great. I almost shared a thug tear. Uh, that was cool to see the the respect they have, the brotherhood, the rivalry. I give this uh. I did, I did the Bret Hart stuff that you mentioned. I have to dock my score down, so I'll give it an eight out of ten. It, only that in, it, it seemed like some of his career was rushed when they talked about it. But yeah. um, if they had to rush through that to get in the stuff about uh, uh, his family, I, I understand. But um, maybe uh, your A and E, you could make a biography two hours and ten minutes if you want. <laughs> Exactly. You have control of this thing of where you put dedicate your time into. I agree with you on the the highlight of stuff. I think Austin talking about his family is something that we haven't seen before. Something that they really didn't talk about on any of the WWE documentaries, and they won't talk about because that's a kind of a negative light on their lifestyle. So I love the fact that A and E kind of dove into that and had Austin speak about that, asked about that type of stuff. That was very cool. But yeah, like like I like I said before, my favorite part of this was the stuff with the Rock and like seeing that type of relationship that they have and like the iconic rivalry and the icons that they have become outside of the wrestling world that really show their impact on wrestling because these are names that non-wrestling fans people that just enjoy pop culture they know the names the rock and stone cold steve austin that even us in our secret society known as wrestling fans we can go outside of that and speak to our non-wrestling fan friends and if the rock is on our tv on a movie we know who that is if stone cold has a new reality show you know who had who that is and just seeing how that whole relationship came together and the fact that the rock chose the rock you know made sure they say that austin he felt like austin pretty much chose him and that's kind of what the the whole story of them was about that austin needed that 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 running mate because you know you can be a big star but if you don't have that running mate to go with and that's why it's great that you know this is the story of how Austin found that running mate in The Rock and, you know, another big star that we talked about, Hulk Hogan. Next week, we're not talking about Hulk Hogan. We're talking about the guy that he kind of found his running mate in at the time that he was on top. So it's a good segue. Love this stuff. This was this was this was better than the WWE presentation in the way that they talked about certain things, in my opinion. So because of that. I, I won't dock them too many points for the omission of the actual fucking existence of Brett 
the hitman art. Like, y'all acted like the motherfucker never existed. Y'all acted like he never feuded with, with, uh, with, with Stone Cold Steve Austin. Y'all acted like he's not the brother of Owen Hart, the man that put, that injured Austin. you acted like he's not the reason that we got Mr. Man as a character due to the Montreal screw job. I understand Brett's gonna have his own biography. That's great. All I wanted was the mere mention of the existence of Brett the Hitman Hart and how he has a very vital role in the story of Stone Cold Steve Austin. So because of that, I won't dock too many points. I want to dock like 10, but I'll dock two and a half. I'll give it 7.5 out of 10. You have an MVP for this documentary. I'm going to, besides Stone Cold, clearly, he doesn't count. Uh, I'm going to go with The Rock. Uh, so much praise and respect. He really, really loves Stone Cold. I agree. Uh, out of the talking heads, The Rock had the most impactful. He was the biggest star that they had. He felt the most impactful and honorable mention to Kevin Williams, the brother of Steve. Of Steve. Just his reaction to Steve's injury really kind of punched home the point of how big that was on him and his family do you have an lvp lvp i don't really see what the undertaker added here besides being here besides saying that you had the undertaker on this biography i don't think the undertaker really added anything like i oh another uh, another mvp that we didn't really talk about paul Heyman. Paul Heyman, I felt like, was definitely deserves some mention. In he's just so good, the way he he's talks just, about people that he likes. He's so good. <laughs> so good. But, like, the LVP, like, I would, I, I would say, like, the LVP is kind of between maybe Jim Ross, Mick Foley, and The Undertaker, but Jim Ross is so important to the career of uh, Steve Austin that he had to be in this. Uh, Mick Foley, I feel like, added a kind of a fan perspective of seeing his career from afar. I don't really know what The Undertaker said or added to this. He just felt like he was there to be The Undertaker being there. I'm going to go with Triple H. I, I know he's bitter and jealous. Oh, no, I needed the I needed the hurt. Even 25 years fucking later, Triple H is still hurt by the fact that Austin and Rock are bigger stars than he's ever been. I love that. No, Triple H, no. I w- I refuse for you to give Triple H LVP because I got so much entertainment by his contribution. <laughs> you know what? Then I'll just go with A&E for not including Bret Hart. <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 I fucked with that. <laughs> Other biographies to come. The Macho Man, Shawn Michaels, Booker T, Bret Hart, Mick Foley, Ultimate Warrior, and next week, Rowdy, Roddy Piper. What are you the most hyped for? Me, personally, uh, it's kind of a tie. Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, even though we've heard the stories plenty of times, uh, it's still, they're, they're two of my favorites. Um, yeah, I like the Shawn Michaels story, and I feel like A&E will, will touch on things that we haven't really gotten to since that initial when he first came back and he did a documentary, I think that's the best piece that they it's ever. It's interesting. Did. Like, are you, gonna talk about the, are you going to talk about the Montreal screwdriver twice? <laughs> you kind of have to. So I, okay. Now I understand. I didn't know we had a Shawn Michaels documentary. So I kind of understand not talking about the Montreal screwdriver right here, but talk about him existing. Like, like that's all, that's all I wanted. Don't act like he don't exist. Um, I am probably most interested in Roddy Roddy Piper because his story is one I don't think they've done enough on. I, I think I've seen documentaries on everybody you just mentioned or something on Dark Side of the Ring. Like Macho Man would probably be the one I'm most interested in, but I just have seen the Dark Side of the Ring stuff on him and Elizabeth. And that's like such a big portion of his career. I don't see too much to uncover outside of that. So, yeah, it's probably Roddy Roddy Piper. And that'll do it for the Steve Austin biography.
Yes, that is all for our review of the A&E biography on Stone Cold Steve Austin. Let us know in the comment section below what you guys thought about this great biography. I know you guys are letting us know in the live chat as you watch, but let us know in the comments so everyone can see your thoughts on the A&E biography for Stone Cold Steve Austin and maybe on the next review we might shout you out and read some of your comments. So leave those down below. Like this video. Share this video with all your wrestling fans, friends, and family. Of course, if you are new to the True Hill Heat YouTube channel, push that subscribe button. And of course, push the bell to stay notified so you always get notifications whenever we go live right here on True Hill Heat. Romeo, tell the good people where they can find you right here and on social media. The Pride of NY, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, right here on the True Hill Heat YouTube channel, a little show called NX3, where we cover NXT every week. And True Rewind, uh, it'll come back sometime in the near future, hopefully, if the Peacock can put some WCW Nitros on the network. On the Peacock, excuse me, I said network. Whoa, I'm naughty with me. <laughs> they want you to put it on the Peacock. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, you can find me on Twitter at TrueHeelSP3. You can follow the gang, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, True Hill Heat. Of course, you are here on the True Hill Heat YouTube channel, and you can find me on the True Hill Heat weekly podcast every single Saturday. Check out True Hill Heat 121 with Darius Carter, my boy here, Romeo Anthony Cologne, as well as Battle Club Pro promote, promoter and owner, Joe Kim Morales, great episode talking about the WWE releases and the fallout from WrestleMania 37. And find me over on the Wrestling Daily YouTube channel with Alex McCarthy every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, live. Find me on Sports Keto Wrestling YouTube channel every single Friday, immediately following SmackDown with Rick Uchino and the wrestling legend Dutch Mantel with Smack Talk reviewing SmackDown and powered for. The TV's YouTube channel every single Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern Time with John Scott for Power 4 SP3. Like, comment, share, and subscribe for Romeo Anthony Cologne. It is me, it is me, your True Hill Phenom SP3. This has been our review of the A&E biography for Stone Cold Steve Austin. We are signing off until next time. <laughs>